Hello and welcome to our midweek meditation. I'm Victor Kim. I'm the minister here at Richmond Presbyterian Church. And as always, it's a delight to be with you for these meditations. Today, I wanna to talk to you about three sort of different things that are interrelated. The first of these is something that some of you may have heard about. It's a series on Netflix called Squid Game. The second is the recent release of the information regarding what's known as the Pandora Papers, which is a release of a lot of information about offshore accounts held by the very, very wealthy around the world. And then the third thing that I want to talk about is our continuing series on the Lord's Prayer and the specific phrase, give us today our daily bread. So I want to talk about how all of these things are related uh, to one another. I want to begin with the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day, give us today our daily bread. And one of the ways to understand this prayer around the word bread, around the word bread, is to pray for enough, right? Daily bread. What is daily bread? Well, it's really enough, sufficient. What is sufficient for us? But I think the reality is that praying for enough, praying for something that's sufficient for our needs is really, really difficult in the context of a culture which is so based on constant consumption, right? It, we're just always being driven to seek more. If, if praying is bending our lives toward God, if, if the act of praying is to bend our lives toward God, that, that bending needs to be consistent it needs to be regular. It needs to be something daily that we do daily. Not, and that's going to be difficult. That's going to be difficult when we think, when we're convinced that we have all that we need, when we have enough, when we have more than what's just sufficient, but that we have a surplus. It's hard to do that. Someone once told me, recently about a show on Netflix called Squid Game. And they told me a couple of weeks ago, hey, heads up for this. It's going to be really, really big. I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and I have no idea what this Squid Game is. But over the last week or so, I've heard a lot on the media about this Netflix show called Squid Game. And it is a, uh, it's a TV show on Netflix uh, I guess not a TV show, but it's a, it's a series that Netflix has developed, and it's a Korean, it's, it's Korean in origin, and the name Squid Game uh, originates from a, a children's game that apparently was played in Korea. I never did, but some people did. Um, it's a nine-episode series that's currently airing on Netflix. Listen, if you haven't seen it, I don't recommend that you start watching it. It's extremely graphic. It's extremely violent. If you don't like killing, if you don't like be people being killed on screen by many, many different methods, don't watch it. I don't encourage you to watch it. You've been warned. I watched it because someone said I should watch it and because it is, it turns out that it's a scathing commentary, scathing social commentary on the reality of this huge wealth gap in Korea, but really that applies to all over the world, all over all the culture, all the cultures, all the countries in the world. I won't get too much into the details of the show. As I said, it's very graphic and it's disturbing, but, but the point of the show is this. If, if you happen to be a person whose life was overwhelmed by debt, uh, that your life was just this hard scrabble scraping by day to day with little or no hope of ever making any difference. If you were faced with hospital bills that your loved ones were facing that you just couldn't pay, the loss of your business, your family, if you were threatened by uh, collectors, loan sharks constantly, would you risk your own life? Would you risk your own life for the chance to win an unthinkable amount of money? Would you risk the lives of others for that opportunity? And what you discover is that for far too many people, living their lives in this abject poverty, in, constant, in a constant state of need and fear and anxiety with too many daily humiliations to count, 
they're led to a decision to risk it all. After all, life as they know it right now is a daily hell. How could, how could it get any worse? And so the show is premised upon a bunch of people who are willing to risk it all, including their lives, the lives of their fellow competitors, so that, that they can get the jackpot, that they can win this incredible amount of money. And then as I'm watching this show, in the midst of watching the show, the news came out about what's called the Pandora Papers, a release of millions of documents, millions of documents that shed light on how the very, very rich among us use offshore bank accounts to shelter their money so that in some cases that they don't have to reveal who's actually buying all of these incredibly um, opulent properties that are being purchased all over the world in some cases so that they don't have to pay tax on these purchases and these, these transactions. In other places where money laundering can take place to hide the proceeds of funds that were gotten illegally by criminal acts. I think, I think most of us knew about these sorts of offshore accounts. You know, we probably heard about the Cayman Islands and things like this, but the Pandora Papers reveal just how extensive the use of these accounts really, really are. And accounts estimate that somewhere between five and a half trillion to $32 trillion are currently hidden offshore and that governments around the world have lost upwards of $600 billion in tax revenue. Now, I'll make clear that not all of, it, not all of this is illegal. It's not illegal, but it does allow for some of the assets that might have arisen from criminal actions to be hidden, and it raises all sorts of ethical questions. It may not be illegal, but is it ethical? And there's also the fact that you can't do things like this. You can't get an offshore bank account, pay for the people to keep your privacy, um, to keep your identity hidden, unless you already have money, unless you're already wealthy. It costs money to hide money, to shelter money. It's been disclosed that rulers of poor nations have millions or billions of dollars stashed away or have, have bought incredibly expensive properties through companies that are not in their name. Others have used their money after selling companies that have eventually gone bankrupt to go on spending sprees for other high-priced properties. Look, there's probably a lot more that can be said and will probably continue to come out in the news cycle, but you get the drift. You get the drift. And again, not necessarily illegal, but just because you follow the letter of the law doesn't mean that you understand or follow or respect the spirit of the law. And in a world where far too many have far too little, far too few have way more than their share of daily bread. We know that. When you've got millions and billions hidden away where it can't be touched by anyone else, how easy could it be to practice bending toward God. I mean, would it ever occur to you, would it ever occur to you that you need to bend toward God, to be dependent upon God for God's provision in your life when you've got millions or billions of dollars stashed away? When Jesus says, after the rich young ruler walks away from him, because even though he wants everything, he can't have the one thing because he won't sell all that he owns, and give the money to the poor and come and follow Jesus. When Jesus sees that, Jesus says it's so hard for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to get into heaven. I think I know what he's getting at. I think I know what he's getting at. But lest we think that Jesus is only going after rich young rulers or people that can afford offshore accounts, we need to remember just how wealthy most of us are. I have to remember how wealthy I am in comparison to the majority of the people in the world who live either in poverty or in very, very close to poverty conditions. You know, I think sometimes people would like to live by the maxim, the Lord helps those who help themselves. They think it might be in Proverbs somewhere. I assure you it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is a different verse. To whom much is given, much is expected. What else is in the Bible is that passage 
where Jesus gathers the sheep and the goats and tells the sheep that when he was hungry, they fed them. When he was thirsty, they gave him something to drink. When he was naked, they clothed him. When he was a stranger, they welcomed him. When he was sick, they took care of him. When he was in prison, they visited him. And of course, the sheep are, Jesus, when did we ever see you and do this to you? And Jesus' answer to the sheep is, when you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then to the goats, in the reverse, Jesus says, I was hungry, but you didn't give me anything to eat. I was thirsty. You didn't give me anything to drink. You didn't clothe me. You didn't welcome me. You didn't visit me. You didn't care for me. And the goats plead ignorance. What do you mean? When did we see you, Jesus, and fail to do any of these things? But of course, you can't help Jesus only when you think you see him. It's when you help anyone. It's when you help anyone who's in need that you truly are helping Jesus. And isn't that the point of the prayer that Jesus taught, right? Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. There's a real sense of collectivism, right? Community around this prayer. Am I going to fix the situation for those whose lives are so desperate that they would risk their very lives to get wealthy? Am I going to get those who can't possibly spend all the money that they already have to be more transparent about that wealth, to be more understanding of the idea of what is sufficient and what is enough? I don't think so. I'm not going to make a difference. In either case, not me, not me alone. I can't. But there's hope. There is hope. I can't make a difference by myself. But as I continue, as I continue to pray the prayer of Jesus, as I join with other countless Christians, bending our lives toward God, God will use us to make clear what Jesus said, that in his incarnation, in his coming to be one of us, in his being made one of us, that the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. I have a role to play. You have a role to play. I can't give up hope because God in Jesus Christ has said that the kingdom of God has come near and that God in Jesus Christ will bring about the fullness of that kingdom in God's time. At the end of Squid Game, the temptation is for the survivor, the survivor of the game, to lose all hope. Because even though now he's got the money, he's wealthy, his guilt, his shame, his shock prevent him from enjoying this money. He is completely disillusioned by the whole process. He has a final encounter, which I will not give away in case anybody is watching. But in that encounter, his hope in humanity is restored, and he decides to live in a way that will make a difference. He decides to live in a way that will make a difference. Our hope, my friends, in humanity, our hope in humanity is actually not humanity, right? Our hope in humanity doesn't rest with us, but always rests in the God who loves us, the God who loves us. May our God always restore our hope. And may we respond in ways that will love our neighbors, as we love ourselves, as we love God, so that we can share what we can with those who just need someone to care for them. I want to invite you to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Read it, say it in your own version, whatever version that you usually use, whatever language that might be most comfortable for you, but just I want you to share in the prayer that Jesus taught. And this is from the Matthew 6 version. Says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Amen. 
Friends, it's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Please now watch the musical meditation from Jenny Berdetti, our music director. We'll see you again soon. God bless you. Thank you.